The unusual prehistoric herbivore Leluda rhynchus is thought to have been the Permian period's equivalent of a hippopotamus, although its ecology is currently a source of controversy. Despite its reptilian appearance, Leluda rhynchus was a synapsid, making it a closer, if still distant, relative of mammals. Only named in 2022, it remains fairly obscure, to the extent that this is one of the few life reconstructions of this long-dead proto-mammal. Fortunately, its close relatives like Cotylorhynchus are much better known. Named Caseids, they are famous for their massive bodies and disproportionately tiny heads. Caseids were polycosaurs, the term used for basal synapsids who still looked very much like reptiles. Although polycosaurs like Dimetrodon had been abundant during the early Permian, the more mammal-like therapsids had almost entirely replaced them by the Middle Permian. Leliodo rhynchus is the youngest member of Caseidae, and might very well have been the last polycosaur. It lived during either the Late Wordian or Early Capitanian, roughly 264 million years ago. It was once thought a group of synapsids called the Veranopids outlasted them. However, in recent years, the synapsid identity of the Veranopids has come under doubt, and they instead seem to have been actual reptiles. The only known Leliodorhynchus skeleton is from the Laliud Formation in France, which is the source of part of Leliodorhynchus's name. The other half, Rhynchus, means nose, even though Leliodorhynchus's skull hasn't yet been found. It was chosen because it is the suffix of Cotylorhynchus, a close relative of Leliodorhynchus, and perhaps the most famous Caseid. The species name Gondi is in honor of paleontologist Georges Gond, who helped organize the expeditions which unearthed the Leliodorhynchus holotype. It was first found in 2001, but wasn't fully excavated until 2008. Preparing the fossil took years, and Leliodorhynchus was only described in 2022. Altogether, the holotype consists of about 50 bones. Although much of the skeleton remains missing, these bones are exceptionally well preserved. The Laliudorhynchus holotype is estimated to come from an animal that was 3.75 meters long when it died. The skeleton has a mixture of mature and immature traits, so it is thought to have been a subadult or late-stage juvenile. However, it is possible the holotype specimen was an adult, since some semi-aquatic animals, like Spinosaurid dinosaurs, retained juvenile characteristics into adulthood. Although most of the skeleton remains missing, enough of Liliodorhynchus has been found to confirm its anatomy was similar to derived Caseids like Cotylorhynchus. As a side note, early members of Caseidae like Eocassia differed substantially from Liliodorhynchus and were instead small, lizard-like insectivores. The term Caseid in this video mostly refers to the larger, more derived herbivores, since there is no term for these creatures that also excludes the more basal forms. Caseid rib cages were massive. They expanded over their evolution, presumably to accommodate massive intestines. Herbivores with such huge guts are adapted to ingest huge quantities of low quality plant matter. To carry these massive bodies, Caseids evolved robust forelimbs. It has been proposed Caseids may have also used these impressive limbs in intraspecies battles to protect themselves from predators or to uncover roots. Their toes were short and broad particularly in the case of Liliodorhynchus. Unlike therapsids, Caseid limbs remained firmly in a lizard-like sprawling posture. Combined with their weight, Liliodorhynchus and other Caseids would not have been able to move quickly when on land. The only major part of Caseid anatomy that is not preserved in the Liliodorhynchus holotype is the skull. However, since the rest of the body is the same as derived Caseids like Cotylorhynchus, it almost certainly shared their unusually tiny skulls. It is not yet clear why Caseid heads were so small, but this shape would have hampered their ability to forage from ground-level plants. Their teeth were tall and rounded, with cuspules at the ends. The number of cuspules varies between different species, so without a skull, it is unclear how many Liliodorhynchus had. In addition to these teeth, Caseids also had teeth on their palates and lower jaws. Besides being an uncomfortable sight for Cenozoic mammals, they were also useful for efficiently grinding up food. The Caseids' massive tongues, whose size is inferred from their enlarged hyoid apparatus, are thought to have pressed plant matter against them until the food was ready to be swallowed. Similar teeth evolved in the sailbacked Edophosaurids, who were also herbivorous Permian polycosaurs. Although they had been regarded as terrestrial animals for over a century, 
Some paleontologists now think that the large herbivorous caseids were semi-aquatic animals. Liliodorhynchus is not unique in this regard, but it has the strongest of the supposed aquatic adaptations. One of the primary forms of evidence for amphibious caseids is their bone histology. Their bones lack distinct medulla or growth rings and are very spongy, particularly in Liliodorhynchus. These traits are found in some aquatic animals, although, as will be explained later on, there are serious concerns regarding these conclusions. Besides their bone histology, caseids seem to have been uniquely challenged when it came to foraging in a terrestrial environment. The long necks of the later sauropod dinosaurs allowed them to forage vast distances while expending very little energy moving. In contrast, the short necks of the large caseids meant their necks had a much more restricted range of movement than those of modern grazers. They would have had to partially immerse themselves in the water to even drink. Foraging on land would require them to move constantly, which would have been energetically expensive. Furthermore, caseids like Liliodorhynchus were specialized towards a diet of hard-to-digest plants. They would have needed to consume a lot of food to make up for its low quality, and the arid environment of the time meant there wouldn't have been that much food available. The amount of energy expended for each meager bite may have simply been unsustainable. On the other hand, foraging in the water would have been energetically less expensive, and this environment may have offered a richer food supply. They may have even been able to use their forelimbs to move plants into the reach of their mouths. Not all paleontologists agree that the Caseids were semi-aquatic. One of the criticisms of this hypothesis is their low bone density. Semi-aquatic animals typically have very dense bones, which allows them to sink under the water. Aquatic animals with spongy bones instead live in the open ocean, and have evolved them as a result of prioritizing speed and maneuverability. These words do not apply to caseids under any circumstances. Spongy bone has a variety of other uses that doesn't imply an amphibious lifestyle. Of note, it can be used as a weight-saving measure, which would have been very helpful for these plump synapsids. The authors of the paper which named Liliodorhynchus suggested something a bit different from the prior hypothesis. Rather than being a specialized swimmer, the paper suggested that, much like today's hippos, Liliodorhynchus was more of a bottom walker. Its broad toes would have been well suited for this, although the authors still believe that it would have been a better swimmer than its mammalian counterparts given its paddle-like feet. Although hippopotamuses are semi-aquatic, they primarily consume terrestrial plants near the shore rather than water plants and algae. Given the presence of terrestrial plants close to the Liliodorhynchus skeleton, the authors suggested the same for it, although Liliodorhynchus doesn't seem to have been any better at foraging on land than other caseids. The authors did caution that aquatic flora is less likely to be preserved, so it remains possible that it primarily fed in the water. However, there are still some problems with Liliodorhynchus's proposed ecology. Hippos have dense bones, like most other semi-aquatic tetrapods, which helps them sink to the bottom of rivers and lakes. Liliodorhynchus's spongier bones may have compromised its ability to do the same. Additionally, if Liliodorhynchus was semi-aquatic, its preferred habitat may not have existed for much of the year. 264 million years ago, Liliodorhynchus's home in southern France was at the equator of the increasingly arid Permian world. The climate had distinct wet and dry seasons, and many bodies of water repeatedly dried up each year. A counter-argument is that hippopotamus fossils have been found from arid and seasonally arid paleoenvironments, even though they are predominantly aquatic creatures. Some caseids may have likewise died in environments different from where they typically lived. On the other hand, other paleontologists have noted that caseids, like Cotylorhynchus, seem to be consistently found in seasonally dry environments unsuitable for the proposed semi-aquatic lifestyle. However, the Liliodorhynchus holotype was found alongside the fossils of an aquatic tupilacosaurid amphibian, a creature whose survival was dependent on the presence of large bodies of water. An amphibious population of Liliodorhynchus would have also needed less suitable habitat than an equally large population of hippos. Like most other mammals, Hippopotamuses are endotherms, who spend most of their energy maintaining their body temperature. As some of the most basal synapsids, caseids never developed a high metabolism, meaning they needed a lot less food to survive. While the Ludorhynchus's low metabolism may help to counter one criticism of the semi-aquatic hypothesis, it creates another. Hippos spend most of the day in the water to avoid overheating. 
In contrast, as an ectotherm, Liliodorhynchus was reliant on the external environment to stay warm and active. With its large, rotund body, Liliodorhynchus was still vulnerable enough to overheating to benefit from the opportunity to cool down in the water, but it would have struggled to remain active at night. Even if it was semi-aquatic, Liliodorhynchus's ecology may have been less hippo-like, with it primarily feeding on aquatic plants while coming ashore to bask in the sun. However, assuming it did forage on land, the changing world of the Middle Permian would have given Liliodorhynchus a very good reason to adopt a hippo-like strategy, but in reverse, foraging on land during the day while resting at night. During the early Permian, the top predators were ectotherms, who would have been as lethargic during the night as their potential victims. The therapsids which replaced them did not have this weakness. Most pelycosaurs would have been nearly defenseless against such foes, and unlike most modern ectotherms, they were too large to hide during the night, potentially explaining their disappearance. However, an inverted hippo-like lifestyle would have given Caseidae a fighting chance. If attacked during the day, they would have had enough energy to either whack them with their giant forelimbs or escape into the safety of the nearby water. The Caseids could stay in their aquatic sanctuaries during the night when they would have otherwise lacked the energy to properly defend themselves. Liliodorhynchus may have been better suited for spending its resting hours in the water than hippos. A hippopotamus must surface to breathe at least every six minutes. As an ectotherm, Liliodorhynchus's oxygen supply could have lasted much longer. Of course, the herbivorous Caseids may have instead survived by focusing on consuming aquatic flora, which they seem to have been adapted for anyway. Overall, a lot remains to be learned about how Liliodorhynchus lived. However, the traditional model of terrestrial Caseids doesn't seem very plausible anymore, and the Liliodorhynchus, at least, seems to have been better suited for an aquatic, hippo-like ecology than its relatives. A phylogenetic analysis in the paper that described the Liliodorhynchus found it, along with the Caseid Aliarosaurus, to be nested within the genus Cotylorhynchus. Notably, although the last of the Caseids are found exclusively in Europe, Cotylorhynchus was native to North America. Much like Liliodorhynchus's lifestyle, the paper's conclusions regarding Caseid taxonomy have not seen universal acceptance. Since the phylogenetic tree found Liliodorhynchus to be nested within Cotylorhynchus, the authors concluded that the three species of Cotylorhynchus should be split up into separate genera. This seems to be based on the idea that a genus should be monophyletic, when it would make more sense to simply consider Liliodorhynchus a descendant of the Cotylorhynchus genus. Paleontologist Dr. Christian Kammerer, an expert on Permian synapsids, considered splitting up the Cotylorhynchus genus to be unnecessary. He also said that Liliodorhynchus should be considered a new species of Cotylorhynchus instead of its own distinct genus. If this opinion wins out, then in the future, Liliodorhynchus gondii will be called Cotylorhynchus gondii. As perhaps the last Caseid, and possibly even the last Pelycosaur, the extinction of the Ludorhynchus is of particular interest. It, or its as of yet undiscovered descendants, may have been victims of the end Capitanian extinction, which marked the end of the Middle Permian. This was a major extinction event that, as the name implies, transpired at the end of the Capitanian Age, about 259 million years ago. Although its cause and scope are still debated, it is generally thought to have been at least partially the result of volcanic activity much like the later and more devastating Great Dying at the end of the Permian period. There is a gap of several million years between the Liudorhynchus and the end of the Capitanian Age, but the last Caseids seem to have been restricted to Europe, which would make it easy for their fossils to have so far eluded science. Instead of falling victim to a global extinction, the Liudorhynchus may have instead died out due to being unable to keep up in the evolutionary arms race with the new therapsid carnivores. During the Middle Permian, predatory dinocephalians called anteosaurs became well-suited towards pursuing prey into the water. As anteosaurs grew in size, the Liodorhynchus would have eventually found the water was no longer the refuge it once was. Another possibility is that the remaining Caseids may have instead been outcompeted by new herbivores called pereosaurs. These armored plant eaters appeared just after the Liodorhynchus and their teeth were similar to those of herbivorous Caseids implying they ate the same plants. Pereosaurs were reptiles, but had semi-erect limbs and elevated metabolic rates, like the contemporary therapsids. This may have given them an edge over Liludorhynchus. 
Of course, instead of being responsible for their demise, the Pereasaurs may have opportunistically replaced the Kaseids after they succumbed to something else. Either way, although they had a presumably similar diet to the Kaseids, Pereasaurs do not seem to have been hippo analogs. An isotopic analysis of Pereasaurs and other local Permian fauna found they were primarily terrestrial animals, while it was herbivorous species of dinocephalians who spent more time in the water. If such a study could be conducted on the Leodorhynchus or other closely related Caseids, it could help to clear up much of the current confusion surrounding them. At least for now, a lot of questions remain regarding this bizarre pelycosaur. Was it semi-aquatic or terrestrial? If it was amphibious, did it primarily consume aquatic or terrestrial plants? If the latter, how did Leliodorhynchus manage to efficiently eat them with its short neck? Besides its lifestyle, there is also debate as to whether Leliodorhynchus is a valid genus or simply a new species of Cotolorhynchus. In spite of all the uncertainty regarding this potentially hippo-like Caseid, Leliodorhynchus is certainly an important part of the history of the Permian period. It was the last known member of the first stage of synapsid evolution. It also provides a lesson regarding evolution as a whole. What is often regarded as more advanced is not always strictly better. Although mammals and birds dominate a variety of niches today, ectothermic reptiles continue to thrive by filling others. Likewise, the last of the polycosaurs in the therapsid-dominated world were not their closest relatives, who are more like them, but instead some of the most basal synapsids, and arguably the goofiest among them. Thank you for watching. And a thank you to the Mandalorian for narrating this video. If you enjoyed it, please remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you'd like to see more. Finally, be sure to have a great day.